Good evening and welcome to Pitzer College and our financial aid webinar. I, my name is Kara Moore. I'm the Director of Financial Aid and joining me this evening is the bulk of my crew from our, the Financial Aid Office. Nancy Medina is going to be personing the chat, or excuse me, not the chat, but personing the Q&A and responding to any financial aid questions you might have. And uh, Catherine Acosta, who is our assistant director, she will be splitting the presentation with me. So um, you don't just have one voice for the next hour. And Jenna Mole is um, handling all of our slides and all of our technology. Also with us tonight, I'm sure you know, Duan Duan and Alex from Admission, as well as um, Yvonne Baruman, who is our Vice President of Admission and Financial Aid. So they will be here to respond to any questions that you might have with regard to admission. And Nancy is just the utmost in responding to anything about financial aid. We also will have time at the end of the presentation where we have some general questions that we get that we'll cover but also uh, if you have specific questions that um, are not, haven't been addressed during the presentation, we'll be ready to assist you at the end of the presentation as well. So Jenna, let's get going. So what are we gonna talk about tonight? This is really a pretty basic overview about the financial aid process at Pitzer. We're going to cover some real basics about the financial aid process such as sources and types of aid. We're going to let you know how we estimate and, the, and determine the cost of attendance. Most critical, how to apply and some real good tips on how to apply. Deadlines are very important. Uh, so we are definitely include those. We'll give you some tips. And then as I mentioned before, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. So what is financial aid? When you hear that terminology, it is it covers quite a bit of things, but it's basically resources to help students and their families pay for the cost of education. When we say financial aid, uh, it can mean both merit-based, uh, which is aid that goes to students based on them meeting some perhaps um, athletic um, ability or having a special academic ability, or um, a uh, science act, um, ability, or it can be need-based. Here at Pitzer, most of our financial aid is awarded based on need. So we're a need-based financial aid program. So you'll hear the term cost of attendance and you'll see those letters COA in a lot of publications. And Financial aid has a lot of acronyms. And so we try to give you the explanation behind them, but hopefully over the next um, you know, half hour or so, you'll get it, the hang of some of our acronyms and it'll help carry you through the financial aid process. When we talk about the cost of attendance, it really consumes a, a variety of different elements. There's obviously tuition and fees, and room and board. Those are the things that are typically charged to a student's account and what the student needs to pay up front. But as we know, tuition and fees and room and board aren't the only expenses that a student can incur to attend college. You have to buy books. So we include an allowance in our cost of attendance for books and supplies. We also know you're going to have personal expenses. You're gonna to need to buy shampoo and you may need to also wash your clothes. You're not gonna always be able to take them home to have your folks do them, do your laundry for you. So you need to buy things like toothpaste and soaps and such. So that com comes under the heading of personal expenses. Also, we realize that you will have transportation expenses. You need to get to Pittsburgh, you need to go home over the holiday break and you need to go home at the end of the academic year. So how we establish transportation really is based on the home state in which you're located. If you happen to be in Southern California, obviously your transportation budget won't be the same as if you live in New York. You've got a little bit farther to go and it's a little bit more expensive. So all of those components make up what we refer to as our cost of attendance or 
COA. The next acronym you'll need to learn is EFC, and that stands for Expected Family Contribution. It is really a measurement of the student as well as the parent's ability to contribute towards the cost of education. And this family contribution has two different components. We do have an expectation that students will contribute towards their costs during an academic year. That's either based on students' income from the, the base year of the application or their assets and their assets, I should say. And then there's a parent contribution, which is determined based on parent income and assets. So when you add those two together, that is the EFC, your expected family contribution. Financial need. What do we mean when we talk about that term? It's a basic math um, equation. So to determine how much a, fam a student needs, um, what their financial need is to go to school, we take that cost of attendance, that tuition fees, book supplies, that big um, number, we subtract the expected family contribution, and then what is remaining is the student's financial need to attend Pitzer. And one thing that Pitzer has been committed to doing for, for many, many, many years is we do meet 100% of that student's demonstrated need. So our cost of attendance, approximately 77,000. If your family contribution is 27,000, then you have a financial need of 50,000. And it is our goal and our commitment to you to meet that $50,000 need. So where does the money come from that we're using to meet that financial need? It comes from a variety of sources. Um, we always like to say thank you to the federal government because they do provide quite a bit of financial aid to students. Um, it comes in the forms of grants as well as loans and work. Various states have financial aid programs as well. The state of California has a very robust Cal, uh, program referred to as Cal Grant, but many other states have state grant programs <clears throat> as well. Colleges and universities step up and provide quite a bit of assistance to students get in, as a source of aid. And we don't wanna forget that there's private sources. These are the scholarship agencies that are out, um, in, out there providing scholarship dollars to students. Um, there may be foundations that provide scholarships to students as well. And we don't want to forget parents, uh, employers or student employers. Um, quite often, um, employers will have benefit programs for their employees that either provide scholarship dollars to students or they may have tuition remission programs as well. So financial aid can come from a variety of places and we want you to explore all of them. So what types of aid are there? Obviously at the very top, we always like to talk about grants and scholarships. This is free money. You don't have to pay it back. It is a grant, a gift to you um, towards your cost of, cost of attendance. We also include student loans. <clears throat> uh, the student loans, the programs that we uh, consider in determining a financial aid package, you borrow those loans now, but you're not required to make payments until after you leave school. So it's an investment today uh, to, uh, that you can pay for tomorrow. And of course, student employment. Uh, we have a lot of loan pro a lot of student employment programs, which gives you an opportunity to work while you are enrolled um, and earn money during the school year to meet some of those elements in your cost of attendance. So where do the grants and scholarships come from? Well, from the federal government, we have two primary grants. There's the federal Pell Grant, which when the student completes a FAFSA application, when they get their student aid report in response to submitting the, the FAFSA, there will be a little message on there that says you appear to be eligible for a Pell Grant. 
or it may say you appear to not be eligible for a Pell Grant, but that doesn't mean there isn't other grant assistance available to you. There's also the SEOG program, and that is another grant. Um, that particular program, the federal government gives the money directly to the colleges and universities to award to students based on the federal criteria. So <clears throat> we have those funds at Pitzer, and uh, we award SEOG funds um, in accordance with the federal criteria, which is to give this, um, those dollars primarily to Pell Grant recipients. And then the state grants, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Cal Grant has a great program and there's a Cal Grant A as well as a Cal Grant B that are awarded to students based on financial need and academic achievement. And both of those work perfectly at Pitzer. I mentioned earlier the outside scholarships. And one of the things that we want to make sure that you research to the best of your ability is some scholarship search engines. And we've listed a couple of those uh, that are most common that are here that on this, on this slide. And these are ones that we have used, we um, recommend to students to use. We are, we want, I want to caution you that if you go out to the, uh, the internet and you search for scholarship organizations and you find one that says for, you know, for $39 or $89, sign up here and we'll give you a long list of um, scholarship resources. If they're asking you to pay money for scholarships, don't do it. It, in most instances, this comes up every year. And really those are scams because most of the information that they're providing you, you can easily get from a free source like FastWeb or Unigo. Um, we also suggest that you check out other private companies um, and uh, parents, employers, uh, tuition benefits as we've included in the second um, major bullet that um, many parents can contact their employers and see if they offer tuition remission or scholarship programs. And then of course, grants and scholarships, a large chunk of those funds come directly from the college and university. Uh, there can be merit-based or need-based and the scholarships at Pitzer, almost all of our dollars are need-based. Federal loans. We include subsidized loans when we put together a student's financial aid package. It is a need-based program. And the reason is that the federal government is actually paying the interest on this loan while the student is in school. That makes it a really great deal uh, because you're not accruing any debt while you are enrolled in school. So if, the student, if a student borrows $3,500 their freshman year and is, doesn't end up needing to borrow anymore over the next four years, when they graduate, they will have a debt of $3,500, the, the exact amount that they borrowed when they were a freshman. Interest only starts to accrue when the student actually enters repayment. Now, some students need a little bit more support from the loan programs, and there is an unsubsidized loan, um, which mirrors the federal direct loan, um, the, uh, mirrors the subsidized in that it is, um, it does not need to be repaid while the student is in school. It also has the same low interest rate as the subsidized loan. The difference is it isn't need-based. Any student can borrow from the unsubsidized loan program and interest does accrue while the student is in school. But as I mentioned, the interest rate is very low and you have the ability to pay the interest while it's accruing during the in-school period. Or if you like, you can postpone and wait until uh, you go into repayment and then it's added to your balance at that point. Parents also have the opportunity to borrow. The Parent PLUS loan is a federal loan program and it is not need-based. And parents can borrow up to the full cost of attendance. Yep, that was that $77,000 figure we talked about earlier. 
parents could borrow the full amount if they wanted to. Uh, but they can also borrow as little as they think they need to help um, support their uh, child while they are in school. So um, the parent plus loan, we do not include unsub loans or plus loans when we put together a student's financial aid package. If you're interested in looking at those programs to support uh, your costs here at Pitzer, then you can certainly reach out to our office and we are more than happy to provide you the information um, necessary to apply for those loans. We often get questions about um, private loans or alternative loans. And we suggest that you take a look at those um, and research them. Sometimes the private alternative loans may offer a, an interest rate that is more attractive to a parent than the parent plus loan, the federal loan. But there's also some other benefits that the federal loan program, the PLUS program might offer that the alternative loans don't. So we just say that, you know, be a good consumer, look and check them out and see which one actually meets your personal needs better. Um, PLUS loans, you can defer while the son or daughter um, is in school. Um, some private loans allow you that option as well. Uh, they may have lower interest rates, but they may not have an interest rate cap. So a lot of different things to consider when you look at loan programs. Student employment. Student employment is, um, is a big thing at Pitzer. We really encourage students to take the opportunity to work on campus or off campus. We have some great community service opportunities for students. There's a lot of tutoring um, with young children. There's also working in the community with a variety of different nonprofit organizations. Student employment is based on need. It is a federal loan, it is a federal work program. And uh, so we build that into the financial aid package. Wages are paid directly to the student. So it's just like any outside job. And we do pay students every other week um, their work city wages. Uh, the student does need to um, figure out how they want to use their, their work study earnings. If they want to use that towards those miscellaneous expenses, or if they um, are using it to, um, towards their transportation funding to go home in the spring, it's really up to you. Uh, we don't guarantee you a job. You have to come to campus, go to the job fair and uh, get yourself hired. But there's lots of employment opportunities at Pittsburgh. So when we put together your, um, your financial aid, we, we put it in a package. And that means it's a variety of different aid types from a variety of different sources. And it's all meant to meet that 100% of your demonstrated need. So a typical financial aid package at Pitzer includes Pitzer scholarship, which is based on need. It includes a federal direct loan, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And then it also includes a work study allocation. We really uh, encourage students to take the opportunity to work and become familiar with Pitzer. So we give you an opportunity to have a small part-time job. And the reason I say small is it, anywhere from six to 10 hours a week. Uh, the, it's based on minimum wage, which in California in January will be $14 an hour. So uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of hours to um, earn $2,500 over the course of nine months. So you'll see the um, figures in the little box are the loan amounts and the student employment amounts that we include in a student's financial aid package. It does the loan and the work increase a little bit each year as you increase your investment uh, to Pitzer and your education. So you're wondering, okay, I know what the costs are. I now have a good idea of where the financial aid resources might come from, but how am I going to know ahead of time what my family contribution might be? 
And we have a couple of tools that are on our website. Uh, there's links on the admissions page as well as the financial aid page. All colleges are required to have tools to assist a family to determine what their family contribution might be. And the two that we have available to you, one is called My Intuition. And it is a pretty simple calculator. And it takes about five minutes. They ask you about six questions and you get a range of, of what your family contribution might be. So it goes from, let's say 5,000 to 8,000 um, or 15,000 to 20,000. So that gives you just a ball, a, you know, what we refer to as kind of really a ballpark estimate. Now, if you're planning to apply to Pitzer, you know you need to fill out the CSS profile. And if you use the net price calculator, I think of it as a training tool to complete the CSS profile. It does take about 20 minutes, uh, but it does give you a much more in-depth estimate of what your uh, family contribution would be. It asks a lot of similar, a lot of questions that are on the CSS profile. So as long as the information that you put into the net price calculator is accurate based on your taxes, then it'll give you a really good estimate for, of what your family contribution might be. So how to apply? I'm gonna turn it over now to Catherine. Thank you, Kara. Okay, so let's talk about how to apply because that's why we all know you're here tonight. So how to apply when you're applying to Pitzer, you're going to fill out the FAFSA application. Our school code is 001172. This information is also available on our website. You'll also need to complete the CSS profile and our CSS profile code is 4619. Again, all of this information you can find on our website on how to apply. And then this year, what we will be collecting from applicants is the 2019 tax return. You'll wanna upload that information to IDOC. Now keep in mind, you're not gonna be able to access IDOC until you complete the CSS profile. Once you complete the CSS profile, it might take you a day or it might take two days. And then once it's processed, it'll give you, actually you'll get an email with the link to get into IDOC and you'll be able to upload the documents. We require information from the custodial parent. If your parents are divorced, it's gonna be your custodial parent and your non-custodial parent. If your parents are married, then it's just your parents tax return along with your information you as a student. Um, so keep that in mind as you're applying. Okay, as I said, we collect two applications. One is the CSS profile and one is the FAFSA. As you can tell from the chart um, here that we put together for you, the FAFSA application is free to fill out. So if you go to something other than fafsa.gov and it requires you to pay a fee, you are on the wrong website. It is absolutely free, that application. You do not need to pay to fill out the FAFSA application. Every school will need that. If you are applying for financial aid, we ask that you, and as the student, that you and your parent complete the form. If your parents have given you their tax information, you can go ahead and complete the form on your own. But keep in mind, on the FAFSA application, you and one of your parents will need to sign the FAFSA application before it can be submitted. Um, why is it required? It's required so that way we can assess and award any federal and state aid if you're coming from the state of California. It is already available. It became available starting October 1st of 2020. The CSS profile, however, will you do have to pay a fee in order to submit the application. For one school, it is $25. And then if you're submitting it to more than one school, it is $16 for each additional school. Waivers are available. If you qualified for a fee waiver on your SAT, if you took an SAT, um, a, you'll need to use the same email address that you used to sign up for the SAT or the ACT. So keep that in mind. If you're using a different email address, you're not going to get that waiver. So make sure you verify what email address you're using and you use the one that you used when you completed the SAT. Um, that is, all of these forms are available online. 
Keep in mind the CSS profile is only applicable to Pitzer, but other schools that are like Pitzer. So if you're applying to any of the other Claremont colleges, you will need to complete the CSS profile for them as well. We each have our own individual school codes. So if you fill out one for us, it will not go to any other school but to Pitzer. So keep that in mind. And then who completes the CSS profile? You and your custodial parent. If your parents are divorced, we're also gonna collect something from the non-custodial parent. If your parents are married, it's just you and your parents who will need to complete the form. And this is required in order for our institution to determine institutional aid. So for Pitzer grants, we're gonna need you to fill out the CSS profile. This is also available already. It became available starting October 1st as well. Okay, on to what information we're going to be collecting. So from your parents, we will need the following information. So parents, when we talk about parents, we talk about biological or adopted parents. If your parents are divorced or separated, living apart, not married, not married and living apart, one parent would be considered the custodial parent and the other is considered the non-custodial parent. Each household must complete a CSS profile on their own. The custodial parent is going to be the parent that you've lived with the most throughout the past 12 months and it includes step parents as well. So non-custodial parent, the way that we it's defined by us is by default, the other parent is your non-custodial parent that you do not live with. And it also includes step parents if that parent is remarried. So non-custodial parent waivers. I know this is a common question that our office gets, but probably other colleges as well um, from students who may not have contact with the non-custodial parent. So the form that, so it's a form that students can submit when they have no contact with their non-custodial parent. It requires additional information. So it requires a statement from you, the student, a statement from the custodial parent, a statement from a third party with firsthand knowledge of the family situation, and any supporting documentation such as legal court documents, maybe a divorce decree, um, anything that's going to verify for us if the type of relationship that you have with the non-custodial parent or lack of relationship that you have with the non-custodial parent. Different schools may have different um, waivers and requirements that they'll require of the non-custodial profile. I'm sorry, the waiver, but this is what we would require if you're going to apply to Pitzer. Okay, let's talk about the data retrieval tool on the FAFSA application. This allows for certain tax return data to be imported from the IRS onto your FAFSA application. We encourage all of our families to use the DRT because it saves time and it ensures an accurate tax data. Um, not all parents and not all students are eligible to use the data retrieval tool. Pitzer still requires that we require you to submit all copies of tax documents, even if you successfully use the data retrieval tool. Um, keep in mind when you use the data retrieval tool, it's not going to show you um, when you're using it, what's gonna be transferred over, but it does show it to us when we receive it at the school. We'll be able to see all of the data elements that have gotten updated if you use the data retrieval tool. But keep in mind, we also do collect the tax return. So if you're not able to use it, we will use the tax return to update your FAFSA application and CSF, CSS profile if maybe something was left out or it wasn't filled out correctly. So we will correct those on your behalf. Okay, tax documents. So they are required to bear, we require it to verify your FAFSA and your CSS profile information that you've submitted to our office. So for tax filers, what we're gonna require is the 2019 tax return. It includes all schedules, statements, K-1s, W-2s, and business tax returns if you own your own business. When we talk about that, we are talking about an 1120, an 1120S, or a 1065. Um, if you, your parents don't own their own business and don't file that, that's fine. Those aren't things that we'll be collecting. If they're self-employed, it's going to be part of their original tax return, which could be a Schedule C. So that'll be included on those forms. So students or parents who do not file a tax return, we would be requiring a statement of non-filing from you. It is available through the College Board 
and we will be asking for copies of your 2019 W-2s as well, or if there are K-1 statements, we will also collect those as well. Now keep in mind, all of this must be submitted for you, the student, and all parents, custodial, non-custodial, and staff parents, and this will be required by being uploaded through IDOC. Here we are to IDOC. So all tax documents and forms should be uploaded to the College Board's Institutional Documentation Service, which is IDOC for short. Our office does not accept tax documents submitted by email. Students can will receive access to their IDOC portal within 24 to 48 hours after submitting the CSS profile. Documents can take up to five days to process by the College Board. So keep in mind that yes, even if you've uploaded it on a Monday and you call our office within 20 minutes asking us if we've received it, keep in mind our office will not have a record of it on being on file because it still needs to be imaged by IDOC even though you've done it online. So it does take a while for them to actually release those images to the college. We would encourage you to keep checking your online student portal as we will be updating that. And we'll talk probably more about that later on in the presentation, but keep in mind, like I said, um, don't, you might not wanna call us the day after you've uploaded because we still won't have a record of it. Please give us a few days to get it into our system and then give us a call if you're not sure if we've received it, okay? Um, upload documents that are visible. So any document that you upload to IDOC, please note that it is visible to any school that you're applying to and you've completed a CSS profile for. If it's something that you don't want going to all schools, I would encourage you to contact our office to see how we would like to receive those documents. If you only want certain documents coming to us, that might include if you're wanting to submit something for a special circumstance or you're wanting to appeal a certain decision um, and you don't want it to go to other schools you're applying to, please contact that school to see how they might want to collect those documents. Okay, so special circumstances. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, obviously. So special circumstances is a way to explain any circumstances, um, any special circumstance um, on the special circumstances section on the CSS profile, but you can also submit a letter to IDOC explaining those in maybe a little bit more detail. On the special circumstances, you are limited to a certain amount of space on the CSS profile. So it might be better also to follow up with the letter to each individual school that you're looking at. Um, also maybe you might wanna call and just ask what additional documents the school might need for a particular circumstance that you have. The letter can also be uploaded to IDOC, but keep in mind if you upload to IDOC, it will go to all schools that you have applied to. So just a note. Um, examples of special circumstances include a change or loss of employment, high medical and dental expenses, or repayment of parent educational loans. Um, could be plus loans for a sibling that your parents had or their own personal um, loans that they had when they went to school, whether it was graduate school or undergraduate school, if they're still repaying those as well. So here are our deadlines for each each round for the application cycle. So most students probably you're gonna be applying early decision and that deadline is gonna be November 15th. Early decision two is January one and regular decision will also be January 1st. Um, so different schools, you wanna look up each school that you're applying to to see what their deadlines are. They may be different from our deadline. So I do encourage you to look online at the schools that you're looking at in addition to Pitzer and see what those deadlines are and make sure that you're also adhering to their application deadlines when you're filling things out, okay? So here are some application tips. When you're filling out the common application, you want to answer yes to the financial aid question. Students who answer no to this question cannot change their response once it's submitted. Um, and are not, I'm sorry, students who answer no to this question cannot change their response once admitted to the college and are not considered for financial aid for the first two years of enrollment. So your first and your second year, you would not be allowed to apply for financial aid for need-based aid at Pitzer. So meaning the CSS profile um, or Pitzer money. 
you can apply for the FAFSA and it would be federal or state aid if you qualified for that. Students are always eligible for loans. So I do wanna let you know that even if you're not eligible for aid from Pitzer, you would be eligible for federal aid. In your final two years at Pitzer, if you are admitted, you could apply do, using and filling out the CSS profile and FAFSA to see if you qualified for any need-based aid and federal aid. So keep that in mind. We also encourage you to use your CSS pro, your SSN on all applications when you're completing them. And then submit, complete, sign, submit, complete, signed copies of all documents. Um, so tax returns, um, statement on filing, whatever form we're asking you, we ask that you complete it and you sign it as well. Okay. So also check your email. Our office sends a missing email documents, notices, and follow-up forms to your student email. We do not email your parents for things that are missing. It goes directly to you, the student. So different colleges may have different requirements. So review each school's financial aid website. And for us, we ask that you go to our website. So you go to pitzer.edu backslash financial hyphen aid um, and click on prospective students to look at our website and see all of the deadlines that are listed there and how to apply for aid. Okay, now we're at the frequently asked questions and I'll hand it back over to Kara. Thank you so much, Catherine. You're um, welcome. We, we wanted to, uh, we compiled a few of the questions that we get typically at every session. So we thought we'd cover these um, and still have time left to ask any particular questions that you might have raised. So let's get to question number one. Does Pitzer offer merit scholarships? Yes, we do. Uh, we have two different programs. One is the trustee scholarship which provides $5,000 per year, and it is renewable for up to four years or eight semesters. Uh, the trustee award, as well as the academic achievement scholarship, which is a one-time non-renewable scholarship that runs between $1,500 and $2,500 a year. These are actually uh, determined by the Office of Admission. So um, if, you, if you're wondering, do you have to do anything special to apply for the merit scholarship? Um, you need to apply for admission and be considered um, by, by the admissions office. They will do that determination as part of their review of your admission application. An additional form is not required. Do you, I need to apply for aid if I'm only interested in merit? No, you don't. It, that is not necessary. Uh, and as I mentioned, all first year students are automatically considered for the merit scholarships um, as part of the admission process. Can I get my package before my admission decision? Unfortunately, we do not have the opportunity to provide you an early estimate of your financial aid eligibility. So that is why we recommended um, that you check out these two calculators, my intuition, as well as the net price calculator uh, to get an idea of what your family contribution would be. We do send your financial aid um, award notification along with your admission decision. So that way you have both pieces of information available to assist you in making your decision. If I don't apply this year, can I apply later? Sure, um, but as Catherine had mentioned, if you are admitted as a non-aid applicant, in other words, on the common application, you said you are not interested in financial aid, then we would not consider you for the Pitzer Scholarship Funds uh, for your first two years. However, federal and state aid is available to you at any time. Um, regardless of whether you are being considered for institutional aid. For the last two years of enrollment, you can submit both of the forms, the profile and the FAFSA, and we would consider your eligibility for all of the aid programs we offer at Pitzer. We talked a little bit about the CSS profile and, um, and getting a waiver. 
Pitzer does not directly provide fee waivers, um, but the College Board will provide a fee waiver. If you received the SAT fee waiver, as, as Catherine mentioned, it'll be automatic if you use the correct email address. But you also have the ability, if you didn't need to um, take the SAT, that you can apply for a fee waiver from the College Board. Oh, do we get this one a lot? What happens if I made a mistake on my FAFSA or my CSS profile? How do I fix it? The FAFSA is pretty easy to make a correction. You just go back into the application at fafsa.gov and make a selection of make FAFSA corrections and click submit. Once you do that, the colleges that are listed on that FAFSA application will automatically get your updates. The CSS profile, we've talked to them about this and they're working towards allowing and making it um, editable after it's submitted. But unfortunately for 21-22, not quite yet. So if you submit the profile and you realize you made a mistake after um, you review your copy of the form, what you need to do is contact the financial aid office at the different schools that um, were listed on the profile and let us know what those errors are. You can um, send us a copy of the, um, of the corrections to our general email address, financial underscore aid at pitzer.edu, and we will go ahead and make those corrections to our copy. You need to do that for every school. Can I add more than 10 schools to my FAFSA? Well, technically no, but yes, how about that? So to, um, to add additional schools, after you've submitted your FAFSA with the initial 10, if you have another three or five or so that you want to submit, you need to go into the fafsa.gov site, click on making a FAFSA correction. And then what you need to do is you'll actually be removing some of the schools that are already listed on your FAFSA. You'll be adding your new schools to replacing the, some of them, some of the original ones, and be sure and add the new school codes and submit for processing. Now, if you had to make a change to any of the data on your FAFSA, then realize that the schools that you've dropped off of the form are not going to get that updated information. So you may have to go in and make another change, another correction to add to those schools back if you want to make sure that they get all the correct data. So a little back and forth. Will an incomplete financial aid application impact my admission decision? Uh, it's possible. Uh, you'll notice that the deadlines that we have for submitting all of your financial aid paperwork, not just your FAFSA and your CSS profile, but also all of the tax data. We need to be, we need all of that information by the same deadline that you need to submit all of your admission application information, because we need that data in order to be able to evaluate your file correctly and uh, make a determination of your eligibility for aid. And if we cannot make an, a determination of your aid eligibility, then we can't provide that information to admission and that may impact their admission decision. If you're having any trouble submitting your materials, don't think, well, I just will try and get to it at some point in time. Please reach out to us. You can call us or you can email us and we'll do the best that we can to assist you in getting the information to us so that we can evaluate your eligibility for aid. 